Laudator Jesus Christus. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, uh, Editor-in-Chief of CFN. Hello, Brian. I hope you're doing well today. Yes, I hope you are. All right. We're uh, coming to you on the, the feast of St. Polycarp, Bishop and Martyr. I'll tell you a little bit about him in a few moments. But first, we'll uh, go over the stories that we're going to be covering today. Lots has been going on and got a lot to report. So our stories today are going to include, first of all, uh, some very sad news, as many of you have probably already heard. We're going to talk about the sudden and tragic death of well-known Catholic journalist George Newmeyer, which happened last week. And as you may know, George contributed to CFN on occasion, and he was always a pleasure to work with, and we're very sorry that he's he's gone. And we ask uh, everyone to pray for the repose of his soul and the consolation of his family, and also for his fiance. It was uh, it's known that he was just recently got engaged. He kind of alluded to that in one of his tweets shortly before he died. So very sad. Um, secondly, we're going to discuss some papal news, uh, a new interview specifically. Uh, of Pope Francis conducted by the Associated Press, including the Pope's comments on two hot button issues, namely homosexuality and the German synodal way, which are very much intertwined as many of our yeah. viewers probably know. Uh, and a lot of our other coverage is also on this same theme, uh, the, sadly this week, uh, also news, uh, an announcement that a pro LGBT priest has been invited by Pope Francis to lead a retreat for bishops just before the synod meeting opens in Rome this October. So we're, as you know, we're in the midst of this now three year long synod on synodality, uh, which has two, you know, official actual meetings of bishops, which is what a synod of bishops is supposed to be a meeting of bishops in Rome with the Pope. The first of which is scheduled for early October uh, to open in early October of this year. And then another one in October of 2024. So this priest is going to be leading this the retreat for the bishops participating in the meeting uh, just before the, the October 2023 meeting in Rome. And then finally, we're going to discuss a few snippets from a new book, which was written by Benedict XVI and published uh, shortly after his death just a few days ago. <clears throat> and specifically, we're going to discuss Benedict's testimony that, quote, in several seminaries, homosexual clubs, quote unquote, were formed that acted more or less openly and clearly transformed the climate of the seminaries. That's a quote from this new book, which is currently only available in Italian. I don't know if there's an English translation in the works or not, but uh, we'll keep you posted if, if that mm -hmm. does happen. But as always, before we get into all the news, uh, we will spend a few moments pondering the things that are above, as St. Paul says, and take a look at the church's liturgical calendar and try to ground ourselves in the spiritual riches of Holy Mother Church. We have a very encouraging saint to look at today. Uh, we're, we're live streaming on Thursday, January 26th, the year of our Lord, 2023. And on the traditional Roman calendar, it is the feast of St. Polycarp, bishop and martyr, who died for our Lord uh, around the year 155 or 156, so an early martyr. In addition to being a church father, St. Polycarp is also uh, called an apostolic father, which is a very elite group, a small group of men who, as the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia explains, were, quote, Christian writers of the first and second, early second centuries, who were known or considered to have had personal relations with some of the apostles, or to have been so influenced by them that their writings may be held as echoes of genuine apostolic teaching. The list of fathers included under this title has varied, but the Catholic Encyclopedia explains that chief in importance are the three first century bishops. Number one, St. Clement of Rome. Number two, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who we'll celebrate next week. And then finally, St. Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, one of the seven churches mentioned in the Book of the Apocalypse. Um, so just a couple of interesting things about his life. So he was a personal friend uh, and a fellow bishop of uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, the famous early apostolic 
church father who wrote a series of letters on his way from um, Antioch to Rome to be martyred around the year 110 AD. <clears throat> and one of those letters was addressed to our saint of today, St. Polycarp. Uh, St. Ignatius wrote to him, quote, be pleasing to him whose soldier you are and whose pay you receive. May none of you be found to be a deserter. So he's using that um, military imagery, kind of like St. Paul does in his epistles. Let your baptism, Ignatius says to Polycarp, be your armament, your faith, your helmet, your love, your spear, your endurance, your full suit of armor. And I also wanted to read just a, a brief excerpt from the martyrdom of St. Polycarp, which is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, account of a martyrdom that we have from Christian antiquity. So it says, now as Polycarp was entering into the stadium where he was going to be martyred, there came to him a voice from heaven saying, be strong and show yourself a man, O Polycarp. No one <clears throat> saw who it was that spoke to him, but those of our brethren who were present heard the voice. And as he was brought forward, the tumult, tumult began, became great. And when they heard that Polycarp was taken, and when he had come came near, the proconsul asked him whether he was Polycarp. On his confessing that he was, the proconsul sought to persuade him to deny Christ, saying, Have respect to your old age and other similar things, according to their custom, such as, Swear by the fortune of Caesar, repent and say away with the atheists in other words those who refuse to uh, recognize the roman pagan gods the idols but polycarp gazing with a stern countenance on all the multitude of the wicked heathen in then in the stadium and waving his hands toward them while the groans uh, while with groans he looked up to heaven and said um then the proconsul said away with the atheists, but he was referring to away with these heathens, essentially. Then the proconsul urging him and saying, swear, in other words, by Caesar, and I will set you at liberty, reproach Christ. Polycarp declared, 80 and six years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? So he was 86 years old when he was about to be martyred. Mm -hmm. And the account goes on to explain, you know, when he refused to do what the proconsul, the Roman official, wanted, um, the proconsul said, I'm going to burn you with fire and to death if you don't do what I want. And Polycarp said to him, you threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and after a little is extinguished, but are ignorant, in other words, the proconsul is ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why do you tarry? Bring forth what you will. So he's saying, do with me what you will. I don't care. <clears throat> and then after they actually lit him on fire, the fire didn't consume him. It didn't even harm him at all. They had to end up stabbing him because God miraculously preserved him in the fire, kind of like um, the children in the fiery furnace. So it's a very inspiring martyrdom story. Yes, so really a great saint to inspire our, our fortitude. Um, but on top of that, we really have a, a action-packed week of saints coming up. There's a, a great string of saints. St. Saint John Chrysostom on the 27th, the Golden Tongue. He's the patron saint of orators, public speaking. If you have to give a speech sometime, pray to him. He's uh, yes. uh, wonderful. St. Peter in Alasco. And then we obviously have the fourth Sunday of Epiphany, our last one before we get into Septuagesima. Uh, St. Francis de Sales, the patron of journalists and the media and the wonderful spiritual director. Again, must, must reading his uh, introduction to the devout life, if you've never read it, on the yes. 29th. St. John Bosco, the 31st. Don Bosco, who is a model for education, particularly of boys and in our our time. Uh, he founded schools and cared and educated. Uh, he also a great prophet. He received private revelation through his dreams that really do seem to speak about our uh, much in our times. St. Ignatius of Antioch, who Matt, Matt mentioned, and uh, father of the church. And then finally, they capped off next week with the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary on February 
Uh, second, the Great Feast of Candlemas, which brings the Christmas Epiphany season to an end. Uh, if there's a high mass, there's a before mass, a beautiful triple blessing of candles with rich in symbolism about the candles. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the procession with those candles as a, a way to, to drive the tenebrae, the darkness uh, out uh, in this sort of dark time of winter. Uh, and as we're about to enter the, the sort of dark preparation in a sense of, of Lent. So it's a uh, uh, beautiful. This is traditionally when February 2nd is when creche scenes, nativity scenes are put away because it, it again marks the end of that, that cycle. Uh, but a beautiful ceremony, a beautiful mass. The candles are held for different parts of the mass, the gospel and the consecration uh, as well. So if you've never seen one, if you can get to one, it's, it's beautiful. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, with that, we will uh, start with our first story, which I said is a very sad one of the, the sudden and tragic death of our, our friend and colleague, George Newmeyer, who was only 50 years old, uh, born in 1972, uh, passed away in the Ivory Coast in Africa, West African nation, where he was uh, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, first of all, to do research for a new book, as he said, and also he was engaged to an, an I, I, Ivorian, I think is what he <laughs> said, so, someone from, from, from the, the Ivory, Ivory Coast. Coast. <laughs> yes. Uh, and he had a, showed a picture with her that all of this is documented in my article, uh, kind of a tribute to, to George on our website, catholicfamilynews.com. I'll just kind of hit some of the highlights. So uh, a week ago today, early in the morning, one of the first things I saw on my Twitter feed was a tweet from the Lepanto Institute, which is led by Michael Hitchborn, who is a, a friend and colleague of George, that said, please, please pray for our friend George Newmeyer. We just received word that he died of malaria last night in the Ivory Coast. And I touched base uh, with Michael Hitchborn, uh, who I knew had been a, a friend a, a friend and colleague of George, and he submitted this statement for which I published, included in my article. He said, George was a one-of-a-kind investigative journalist and a dear friend. His moxie in the face of deeply entrenched and depraved prelates was unmatched by anyone, and his absence is a great blow to us all. <clears throat> he had an eye for truth and a nose to unearth it. He will be sorely missed, and I hope to see him again in the kingdom of heaven. So a very nice tribute to George. Uh, the Lepanto Institute, the same day, last week, Friday, January 20th, also tweeted, uh, regarding the death of George Newmeyer, here is what we know from confirmed sources. And I checked in, and these sources are from family members of George. So it's firsthand information. Uh, it said that George was sick seven days ago. So that would have been like January uh, 12th or 13th, George steadfastly refused to go to the hospital. And then finally, the U.S. consulate tested his body and confirmed that he tested positive for malaria. So that is the report from those confirmed sources, namely his family members. I was actually in touch with George through, uh, you know, Twitter direct message. We would message each other occasionally uh, in mid to late December because George was doing a lot to um, really press on the issue of uh, the Bishop of Richmond, Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, Bishop Barry Nestout, who George found out, <clears throat> I think it was already public knowledge, but George was kind of um, pressing the issue that Nestout had appointed a known public sex offender, Father Wayne Ball, uh, to be the pastor of a parish in the Diocese of Richmond. So in my article on uh, catholicfamilynews.com, there's a tweet where he has video footage of him actually confronting Bishop Nestout at, at the front door of the rectory. The bishop happened to answer the door and George, you know, respectfully, but firmly started kind of interrogating him and asking him, how could you do such a wicked thing? So George was very fearless in that regard. He did the same thing. He actually discovered the residence back in 2018 where Theodore McCarrick was staying. That's before they transferred him to a different state, I think to mm -hmm. Kansas initially. And, and McCarrick is currently in Missouri. So George was definitely a lion-hearted journalist. We need more like him, especially in the church. Yes. And I know, Brian, yes. Brian, you had an opportunity to interview him, I know, at least on one occasion. Yes. Uh, and he really was a great, I think, investigative journalist, very tenacious. Uh, he was investigating, apparently, 
corruption of bishops, particularly, and there was evidence in Africa of where cor financial and other corruption that was going on. Um, right. And he, I think he was going to try to explode in many ways this myth that the conciliar church has been holding on to that, oh, Africa is where the faith is thriving, that it, it, right. it's not really thriving anymore, that it, there really was a great growth that was the outburst from the great missionary work of the early 20th century. But even it is sort of petering out in the post conciliar wilderness. Right. Um, I know the whole thing is very strange. I know he tweeted back in December. Uh, I'm really, you know, investigating some serious things here. You know, I, I'm worried if I, something happens to me, you know, he kind of was signaling. The whole thing is yeah, very I, weird. It is just am, very yep. unusual. And I'm not saying anything specific. It's, uh, I know Robert Moynihan has sort of raised same kind of, this seems really strange. I mean, it's very odd. People don't typically die of malaria uh, these days. I mean, it's treatable. Right. Why didn't and, he go to the hospital? I don't know. It's all very... Uh, unusual agreed and i i embedded the tweet you're referring to in my article yes. so folks can see it but on december 23rd this is what george tweeted it's a series of two actually he said yeah. uh and i so someone he's quote tweeting someone else who had tweeted to him mccarrick is the epstein of the church meaning kind of like the um hmm. uh the person who's organizing yeah. all of this the filthy stuff going on mccarrick is kind of like the ecclesiastical version of epstein so George said, and I suspect there will be some murders before this is over, maybe even my own. Mm -hmm. I am not joking. This is getting scary. But he followed up by saying, uh, but as self-dramatizing as it may sound, I don't give a damn at this point. He was very blunt. I don't care what happens to me. I will, will not sit on my hands as these wicked charlatans defile Jesus Christ's church. It mm -hmm. belongs to him, not them. So. He was very clear that he didn't have a problem with, you know, suffering the consequences of what he was, the work that he was doing. He recognized it could be dangerous. The one thing that did does stick out to me as odd, and again, I have no concrete evidence that contradicts the the official confirmed source mm -hmm. material that we've received. But also, at, towards the end of my article, is a embedded a tweet. He tweeted a photo of himself. What sitting at what appears, you know, his hotel, well, he says it's his hotel, so hotel. Yeah. looks right. to be at, you know, by the pool, just kind of relaxing, smoking a cigar. And he tweeted that um, on January 15th. So just four days before he died. And he doesn't appear to be ill. I mean, I, I know nothing about malaria or what it does to a person, but it, that did strike me as a little odd. So, yeah, I. I don't know. But again, we certainly can pray for the repose of his soul uh, for the good and remember the good work he did do. Absolutely right. And we do have and I've linked to some of his articles in my uh, tribute article. You so you can find if you go to CatholicFamilyNews.com and just search George Newmeyer, several things will come up. So, yeah, just to reiterate what Brian said, we definitely want to pray for the repose of his soul and also for the consolation of his family and in particular for his fiance. There, I also include in yes. my article, yeah. uh, there's a he tweeted several photos with her, so I'm sure she's beyond devastated right now. Um, so yeah, with that, we'll just continue speaking to pray of, for him and... yeah, speaking of devastation, we'll get to our next, story. yes. <laughs> Yes. So uh, this week, Tuesday, January 24th, Pope Francis was interviewed by the Associated Press and some of the topics covered. And just to be clear, you know, it was a video interview, but they they release, you know, they kind of drip it out over time. Yeah. They don't just release the full video. So we don't know what all is included in the interview. But the topics that they've uh, that they've revealed thus far include the the Chinese, the Sino-Vatican agreement, the Vatican-China deal, homosexuality, the Pope's current health status, clerical sexual abuse, and the German synodal way, as well as other topics. Mm -hmm. So the two that we're going to focus on in our report today, well, I guess three, uh, first we're going to look at his uh, comments on homosexuality, then we'll get to the German synodal way, and finally the Father Rupnik okay. case. Yeah, the, so, the first one is the most explosive. I mean, it's really, he said yes. a lot over the years on this topic, but this is 
really, the, I think, the most outrageous. Worse than who am I to judge? We'll see in a, in, in a minute. Yes. So yes. according to the AP, and the AP has been doing individual reports on kind of each different subject, little brief yeah. reports. So in their one on his comments on homosexuality, it explains Pope Francis criticized laws that criminalize homosexuality as unjust, quote unquote, saying God loves all his children just as they are and called on Catholic bishops who support the laws to welcome LGBTQ people into the church. So we have a video clip uh, that was put out. By well, and the there's a little bit press. more of that quote that's important. Those bishops that are not working against it to support those laws, he says, need to undergo a conversion. Right. So right. it's like, it's even more, it's not just, you know, you need to welcome them. He's like, you, you need to convert. I mean, this is what he's right. calling for. But yes, we have a little video clip. We'll show the interview and then we'll talk a little bit more about this radical statement. Titles of what he says. Somos todos hijos de Dios, y Dios nos quiere como estamos y con la fuerza que luchamos cada uno por nuestra dignidad. El ser homosexual no es un delito, no es un delito. Sí, pero es pecado. Bueno, primero, distingamos pecado por delito. Pero también es pecado la falta de caridad con el prójimo. ¿Y vos cómo andás? Cada hombre y cada mujer tiene que tener una ventana en su vida donde pueda volcar su esperanza y donde pueda ver la dignidad de Dios. Y ser homosexual no es un delito. Es una condición humana. Okay, let's just pause on that line. Homosexuality is not a crime. It is a human condition. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's like saying, oh, oh, murder isn't a crime. It's it's a human condition. <laughs> right. And the other significant thing uh, people may have noticed in the subtitles for that video clip, when he says, yes, but it's a sin, it's like he's pretending to be a, a hypothetical objector to what to his own comments. And then he's answering the hypothetical objector. So it's not like he's even affirming himself that it is that the behavior is sinful. Right. He's simply saying, well, so is a lack of charity. That's also a sin. Why aren't we talking about that? As if those are somehow morally equivalent. I, right. He needs to maybe refresh his memory about mortal versus venial sin. Well, again, uh, let's get back to this. He, he's he's uh, uh, taking the sin, which is one of the sins that cry out to heaven for vengeance. Right. Yes. And he say, oh, it's not a crime, not a delict. It's not a crime. Right. And but it's more worse than that, because because you could argue would still be Catholic and say, you know, that for various prudential political reasons, mm -hmm. we can't punish this as a crime right now. And that goes for, for many things. You know, St. Thomas once said, if a society gets so wicked, you can't it's just so many things they do, they won't even listen to you. Then you can't really criminalize just as a practical matter, many things, but he's not speaking at the level of prudence. He's not saying in the modern world, it's so corrupt that trying to outlaw homosexuality is just not possible. He okay. says it is unjust. So he say at the level of morality that even if we were in a hundred percent Catholic country, mm -hmm. it is unjust to have, a law against it. And that is contrary to 2000 years of Catholic teaching. Again, right. it's not unjust to criminalize grave behavior, which affects the common good because homosexuality is not as like, told, oh, it's just a private thing. If it's a sin, it just hurts yourself. No, it is a sin against the fundamental building block of society, the family. That's why homosexuality was Ill illegal, not just in Catholic countries, We'll get to it in a second. It's illegal in countries all around the world, mostly Muslim countries today. It was illegal in the pagan Roman Empire, right? Not the Catholic, the pagan Roman Empire, because the Romans, the pagan Romans understood that it was a vice that was destructive of human society, of the structures mm -hmm. of human society. Now, again, if you come out and said in our world with all the it just it's not practical for politicians to do this now. It's not prudent. That would be acceptable. But to say it's an unjust law, that means you have a right. An unjust law is, say, a law that stops you from doing you something you have a moral right or obligation to do. So what mm -hmm. he's implying is that it is morally right to engage in sodomy. That's really what he's saying. And his bizarre distinction, well, yeah, I guess it's a sin, hypothetically. But, but again, there's 
they, he's making a false distinction here between this crime and sin. It's it's a crime because it is a sin that affects the common the common good. I mean, this is a fundamentally. He's basically saying you have a fundamental right under the natural law to commit sodomy by saying a law preventing you from that is unjust. This is the most outrageous thing he's ever he's ever said on this subject. Yes. And interestingly, on the same day that Francis was interviewed, uh, January 24th, America Magazine, perhaps by design, we don't know, published an article by Cardinal Robert McElroy of San Diego, who's one of the most notorious pro-LGBT prelates in the United States, if not the world, and who was raised to the cardinalate by Francis last August. Uh, he wrote an article about the Synod on Synodality's call for radical inclusion, and uh, we know what that includes, of course. So he wrote, what paths is the church being called to take in the coming decades? While the synodal process already underway has just begun to reveal some of these paths, the dialogues that have taken place uh, identify a series of challenges that the people of God must face if we are to reflect the identity of a church that is rooted in the call of Christ the apostolic tradition and the second Vatican council. So he's claiming that basically that if we don't open ourselves up to sodomy, that somehow we're contradicting the call of Christ and the apostolic tradition. It's ridiculous. He goes well, it's interesting. To, I saw yeah. a satire piece that, that uh, and it may, it was, it may have been the Babylon Bee. I'm not sure, but it said uh, Sodom and Gomorrah demand a retrial before God after Francis's comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's about right. Sadly. Okay. So uh, Cardinal McElroy says in his article, um, it will be a, uh, it will be objected that the church cannot accept such a notion of radical inclusion because the exclusion of divorced and remarried LGBT uh, re the divorced and remarried as well as LGBT persons from the Eucharist flows from the moral tradition in the church that all sexual sins are grave matter. Yeah, that's the case. Yeah, they are right. grave matter. <laughs> This means that all sexual actions outside of marriage are so gravely evil that they constitute objectively an action that can sever a believer's relationship with God. Yes, that's correct. But then he concludes the paragraph by saying this objection should be faced head on. And ultimately, he says, it is a demonic mystery of the human soul why so many men and women have a profound and visceral animus toward members of the LGBT uh, communities. It's not really a mystery. We're concerned about the right. the harm of that very grave, sinful vice on society and on souls. That <laughs> it's not hatred of persons. It shouldn't be, but it is. It's not animus the towards the person, towards the act, towards the right. sin, which is gravely, exactly. as the church has said disordered but again it's clear he is surrounded we'll get to this a little later but he's surrounded by sodomites in the vatican it is right. you know the hierarchy's riddled with either active ones themselves like mccarrick or uh those who are look favorably upon it and promote it and he's right. shown you know who who he is willing to uh, support he come out in favor of i mean through words and actions there's some more in this this program and who is he against the bishops that are standing up for the truth he's saying essentially they need to be converted over right. to his his craziness now speaking of prudence and on, on top of all this he's just it's just utterly diplomatically unprudent what he did because this, this these statements were released right before he's about to travel to south sudan a country <laughs> which criminalizes and enforces it uh, in a very brutal way, a way that Catholics would say is on is really too harsh, uh, but a very brutal way. Uh, mean, I, I it's a capital offense. You're executed for it in South Sudan. He's about to go there, having said this. So where's his ecumenism like with, the, with the Muslims <laughs> in South Sudan? He just threw that out the window, right? So in his pecking order, ecumenism with all false religions actually comes after with outreach to and encouragement of sodomites because remember what he said right. god loves you as you are well that's not true god doesn't love us as we are in terms of what we do he loves us as he created us and mm -hmm. he loves us for what he created us for he doesn't right. love our sins he doesn't love us in our sins he loves us despite who we are despite yeah. what we do but not the way he worded it he loves us as we are which there's no need 
But I guess well, in his logic, doesn't he love the bishops who support these laws as they are? Shouldn't he just love them? <laughs> no, there's no right. logic, obviously. So the one uh, kind of peculiar part of the very peculiar part of this interview is that Francis seems to kind of speak against the German synodal way, but he, I think he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth as he does at some yes. points as the Peronist that he is uh, modeling himself on his, uh, yeah. on the dictator Juan Peron, who was notorious for that kind of behavior. So regarding the German synodal way, this is what the AP reported. In the interview, the Pope said that while dialogue is good, quote, the German experience does not help. Those are words attributed to Pope Francis. He said the process to date has been led by the, quote, elite because it doesn't involve, quote, all the people of God, which doesn't make sense because every anyone in Germany who wants to participate can. That's my understanding. <laughs> Francis says the goal must always be unity. And here's a couple other quotes from Francis in this regard. We must be patient, dialogue, and accompany these people on the real synodal path, Francis said, referring to his global consultation. The aim, he said, is to, quote, help the, this more elitist German path so that it does not end badly in some way, but is uh, also so is also integrated into the church, in other words, into the synod on synodality. Meanwhile, and this has been his, his complaint all along. It's not against the substance of what they're saying, which is outright heresy. It's right. essentially you're doing it the wrong way. You're you're doing it too fast. You're elitist. You're not you're not doing my way. He's basically signaling again by not condemning what they're saying in substance that, mm. hey, I'm going the same place. It's just you're going the wrong way. Follow me. Go my way, not your own way. That's not right. a real what's really needs to be criticized about this synodal way and something else to keep in mind for our audience you know while he's saying all of these seemingly critical things about the german synodal way uh the prospect of francis appointing bishop heiner vilmer the you know a notoriously heterodox german bishop who's all in favor of the german synodal way there is still a prospect that he will be a francis will appoint this man to lead the vatican's doctrinal office that that claim has resurfaced uh, it's resurfaced yeah. via Mesa in Latino, who's proven to be a very reliable source on such matters. They released an open letter in this regard. Mm -hmm. I'll include a, a link to that in the description of this video. And then also an outlet called the New Daily Compass released an article which said, quote, uh, Vilmer is one of the bishops most in favor of overturning the church's teaching on sexual morality, starting with homosexuality. He is the one bishop who was annoyed by the opposition uh, of over a third of German bishops to the basic text on human sexuality during the fourth general assembly of the Synod of the Church in Germany. It contained a few oversights, quote unquote, such as the blessing of couples of same sex of the same sex and the positive evaluation of homosexuality. So this Bishop Vilmer is in favor of all of that filth, yes. to, to quote yes. Cardinal Ratzinger. Yes. Uh, so it's unbelievable. Yes. So very, very shocking uh, comments on really both of those fronts. And again, there's some conservatives who already jumped on this. Oh, he's oh, he's criticizing the German synodal way. But again, be careful. He's not really criticizing what needs to be criticized. Exactly. And then the final aspect of this uh, AP interview we wanted to briefly discuss before moving on is Francis essentially denying that he had any involvement yes. in the Father Rupnik case. So if you remember, we reported on this. This Father Rupnik uh, was accused by multiple uh, nuns of psychological and sexual abuse uh, nice. over a long period of time. And there were two cases running, the, the specific case of their accusations for what he did. That case ended because their accusations are from periods uh, time ago that have now exceeded the statute of limitations. Statute of limitations says you have to bring a charge and try a charge within so many years of the events that occurred. And th their charges were brought after that. Um, but there was a second case that did proceed, which was from Father Rupnik absolving his accomplices of sin in the confessional, which is a grave crime reserved to the Holy See, punishable yes. by excommunication. He was found yes. guilty of that second charge, and then that that punishment, excommunication, was immediately lifted without anything. It was just whoop, wiped away, 
no problem. And it was reported widely that Francis himself lifted that excommunication, which he would have to do. It's the Holy See that it's reserved to uh, mm. just right after. So he was asked about this case. Did he pull some strings for Father Rubnick? We know he loves him. In the midst of this, when he was being, when he was, uh, being convicted for this, Francis invited him to preach at the Vatican. So <laughs> and he had to know. I mean, Card he met with Cardinal Ladera, the prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, while this was going on. He had to know that this was going on, and he invites right. him to preach. Well, so Francis is asked, what does he say? Not me. No, no, no. I'm really hard. I punish people. Not me. I wasn't involved. In fact, I only got involved once to speed to make sure that he actually uh, had a trial, to make sure that, it, and he's very vague about it. It doesn't make any sense, to make sure that the, tri the trial was kept with the same tribunal. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not even sure what that means. Uh, and now I fault the interviewer here because they didn't actually ask any hard questions. A real interviewer, mm -hmm. which these people are not, they're part of the corrupt media, would have said, well, it's reported you lifted the excommunication. Is that true? They Correct. didn't ask that. They just took him. Oh, I didn't get involved. Not me. I didn't do it. Now, uh, you know, or, well, why didn't you lift the statute of limitations? They talk about it in the interview. Francis says, mm -hmm. Oh, and there are minors. I lift that all the time. I waive the statute of limitations. I, I, I you know, st I'm really strong if they're a minor. Ah, oh, but if they're an adult, you know, none. Who cares? Basically, he said. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, but he implies that he he could have lifted the statute of limitations defense, waived it, and gone forward, but didn't. But where's the reporter saying, well? Okay, you did. Why did you not do that? Why did you not intervene as you have done in other cases? No, no question. They don't ask that. Again, mm -hmm. the, the news media is corrupt. They, this was a PR. This was not an interview with journalists tr like George Newmeyer trying to get to the bottom of things. This was a, a branch of the deep state, deep church, you know, right. let, helping giving him some PR. So he denies any involvement. But then why didn't you immediately nullify the nullification of the excommunication? If you didn't do it, I mean, again, he would have had to have done it for it to happen this quickly. It's kind right. of like Father Pavone's, you know, issued without appeal. What that means is the Pope approved of his right. defrocking. Same thing here. So, you know, he, he, he doesn't want to take responsibility, even in court of public opinion, for his Peronist acts of pro protecting his sexually deviant cronies. Right. Exactly right. So we... Uh... Yeah, <laughs> we'll include links to all of those sources in the description of this video for those who want to take a look themselves. But that's kind of a rundown of three significant topics from the uh, Associated Press interview. Yes. And we'll now move on to, to what I've called in our outline, Synod Follies. Francis invites pro-LGBT priests to lead bishops retreat. Yes. And again, you sort of see a theme going on here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, it was announced uh, that it's a priest we've talked about actually uh, on this show and in the newspaper several times. So this synod craziness in October uh, will be preceded by a retreat for the bishops before the uh, synod itself begins. And Pope Francis has invited prominently pro-LGBT priest to lead the retreat for bishops before the start. Uh, so warning bishops, this retreat may be a danger to your, uh, your soul, I would say, yeah. <laughs> given who has been, uh, asked to preach. Lock it's, your door it, during the night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Eng English Dominican, Father Timothy Radcliffe, uh, is the person we're speaking about, uh, that will lead this retreat in October of this, uh, year. Uh, again, uh, People who want to deny where he's going, oh, you're reading into things. He's not promoting this. He's not going to have the synod try to do this. Well, why do you appoint this openly? Again, this is a priest who said sodomy acts are fine. They're, they're just expression of love. This is this is who he asked to preach to the bishops right before they go about into what's going to be likely be a pre-engineered meeting with a pre-written document as, as history is any guide to the future. Right, and this the, just to help viewers understand the gravity or this you know the extreme position of this particular priest he is he is known to have said publicly <clears throat> for example in 2006 at a religious education lecture in los angeles quote we must accompany gay people as they discern what this means letting our images be stretched open 
This means watching movies like Brokeback Mountain, which is, as I've never seen it, but I've heard it's very filthy and basically pornographic. He's encouraging people to watch that filth, reading gay novels, living with our gay friends and listening with them as they listen to the Lord. He's also contributed to a 2013 Anglican document, speaking of synodality and ecumenism, called Working Group on Human Sexuality, in which he's quoted as saying, how does all this bear on the question of gay sexuality? We cannot begin with the question of whether it is permitted or forbidden. We can't start there, he says. Well, first we of all, must... it's not a question. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. He says, we must ask what it means and how far it is Eucharistic. I mean, that's blasphemous. <laughs> blasphemy. Blasphemous. I mean, what it means, we know what it means. Read the Bible. Right. <laughs> it means it's a sin exactly. crying to heaven for vengeance, right? That's <laughs> crying out to God. Sin that cries to God. I mean, it's it, this is their trick. They take no-brainers, things that Christians have known. Even Justice Warren Berger, not a Catholic, in the, the concurring opinion in Bauer's uh, uh, opinion of the Supreme Court, said the whole Judeo-Christian ethic considers this behavior contrary to the moral law. Right. But this priest, like, oh, somehow we don't really know. We got to figure it out. We have to discern. Right. We have to stretch our minds. They, that's so, what the modernists do. They create doubt about something about which there's no doubt. So we have a brief video clip. We just want you to see for yourself. This is Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerich, SJ, the Relator General of the Synod, who made the announcement during a press conference uh, earlier this week. I think it was Monday. Yes, January 23rd. This is him announcing this news. It's a great opportunity to have this press conference. Oh, I think it's actually it's the other. Oh, I think sorry, it's the other look. clip. There we go. I just have to make a small announcement. Yes. I just said before that synod is not about church politics. No? It's about listening. <laughs> what a joke. Not about God politics. And they and invite and this them. guy. And praying. So uh, there will be one different point compared to the other synods. After the prayer vigil, the bishops and the participants of the synod we leave for a three-day retreat. So we start with prayer, with listening to the Spirit. Um, it will be from Sunday, 1st of October, to Tuesday, 3rd October. Three days of retreat for the preparation of the Synod. And, uh, uh, this retreat, which will be close to Rome, of course, the Holy Father has invited uh, Father Timothy Radcliffe uh, from the Dominicans to lead us into prayer. So, now again, notice you. Pope Francis. He specifically says that Pope Francis invited him. Yes. Again, oh, Franz Onami, I didn't get involved. Right? <laughs> He's making it very clear. This is the express will of the Pope that this yes. this heretic uh, preach a retreat to all the bishops. And no, it's not just the bishops because the, the, you say synod, it, you didn't, shouldn't have to say bishops. It's, that's all who can go to a synod. He said and other participants because right. they're having non-bishops at the synod. And you may have caught in that clip that Cardinal Hollerick talked about after the vigil, uh, yes. what is he talking about? That So this press conference was actually to formally announce um, that fr what Francis had announced a couple weeks ago about there's going, he's said there's going to be an ecumenical prayer vigil, which will take place on Saturday, uh, September 30th in St. Peter's Square, just a few days before the Synod of uh, the Meeting of Bishops in Rome starts. So the vigil will take place September 30th, and then this three-day retreat for the bishops will be October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, and then they'll then the synod will officially open. And Francis said on January 15th, quote, there will be a special program throughout the weekend organized by the Taize community, which we covered extensively yeah. in CFN over the years, a terrible uh, false ecumenical community, um, for the young people who will come to the vigil. And so we have another clip I want to, wanted to play very quickly. Yeah. So this is what Cardinal Hollerick had to say about synodality and ecumenism towards the beginning of this press conference. 
prayer for Christian unity because it is something we have really at heart. And when the Pope announced this ecumenical prayer, this Thésé prayer, on the eve of the Synod, he also mentioned that the path to Christian unity and the Church's journey of synodal conversion are linked. Uh, the journey of synodality undertaken by the Catholic Church is and must be ecumenical, just as the ecumenical journey is synodal. <laughs> so as if anyone knows what that actually means. <laughs> Again, what does this ecumenical journey mean? Again, we knew what it meant through Pius XII. Pius XI, Mortalium Animos. The ecumenical journey is the return of the dissidents to Rome. Right. Full stop. Exactly. Their meaning is we're going somewhere. We don't know where we're going. John Paul II, ut unum sint. We have no idea where ecumenism is going. So you're on a journey that you don't even know where it's going. But sadly, we I think we do know. We where do it's know. Going because <laughs> at the end, a little bit further on right. in that speech of his, Cardinal Hollerick says, he feels that the church needs the participation of non-Catholics, quote, in order to be really on our path to conversion. But conversion to what, you might be wondering? Well, I think it's it's exactly to an embrace of homosexuality. If you notice on that panel to his um, to his right, to our left, there's an Anglican, you know, quote unquote bishop. Uh, they don't have holy orders, so it's a layman who looks like a cleric. Right. He's on the panel. He's a he's the personal representative of the Archbishop, you know, the foul Archbishop of Canterbury to the Holy See. And this man, uh, in answer to a question during the press conference, said that, quote, when we talk about unity, it's not uniformity. This is the Anglican prelate. We should give space to those who have a different opinion on certain matters. And this was in response to a question about how to respond to concerns that the Synod on Synodality is actually increasing rather than decreasing tensions within the church and fomenting disunity rather than unity, which is the supposed goal of this whole synodal journey. So just, just recently in the last several days, uh, the Church of England has actually uh, caved in and, and is going to give you know approved blessings for homosexual couples. LifeSite News reported on January 19th, the article headline says, Church of England bows to pressure and will allow blessings of same-sex civil unions for the first time. And the the Anglican quote unquote Archbishop of Canterbury's response to this news was, quote, the bishop's response to living in love and faith, which is the initiative, I guess, reflects our diverse views after deep prayer, study, and reflection. Apparently the prayer did not include meditation on scriptures which condemn sodomy. <laughs> He goes on to say, I hope these new prayers of love and faith for same-sex couples say to all Christians and especially to LGBTQI plus people that you are welcome, valued, and precious. Well, they are welcome, and in the eyes of God, they are valued and precious because their souls are precious. They were, were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. And... Um, they need to be called to repentance and conversion, not to be affirmed in something which is intrinsically evil. So if you, Matt, ask the question, where is the synodal ecumenical journey going? You're looking at it. Here it is. This is their model. This is what they want to become. This is, here she is, right? right. That's the bishop, uh, quote unquote, of London. Of London. So at the Friday, 20 January, I'll read for, the, for those who, who are just listening. Friday, 20 January, 23 press conference in London held to announce the House of Bishops' recommendations on the living in love and fellowship process. <laughs> the Bishop of London, the right honorable and right reverend, Sarah Malarkey, oh, excuse me, sorry, Sarah <laughs> Maloli, uh, was asked by a reporter, right, gay Christians have been asking if we can have a civil marriage, come to church, and have that relationship blessed, are we still expected by the church to remain celibate? Or is it now uh, understood if the marriage is blessed and sex should take place within that marriage, then gay couples are allowed to express themselves sexually as well. She replied, 
I recognize it's a question that many, many are proposing. I think that what we recognize is that within the College of Bishops, there will be a range of views that are held on that. <laughs> so There's synodality right there's there. There's synodality. And again, the, the, the person's question is absolutely right. If we can go do this, you can come in and bless us. We obviously are. You're okay with it. But this is what they want, the synodality of ambiguity that where everything goes, God loves you as you are. That's the face of the church that Francis wants, stare, laughing at you from that picture. Exactly. And just to close this story, we should recall the very um, important words of Cardinal George Pell that were penned just very shortly before his death and published by The Spectator regarding the synod. He said, quote, uh, the Catholic Synod of Bishops is now busy constructing what they what they think of as God's dream of synodality. Unfortunately, this divine dream has developed into a toxic nightmare, despite the bishop's professed good intentions. That's is exactly right. It is a toxic nightmare, and it must be opposed uh, forcefully. Yes. Well, I think a uh, little shift, <laughs> although not completely, from our theme. Uh, we're going to turn in our last story to uh, a recently published book, which uh, could be called Benedict the Sixteenth Last uh, Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, this book was published uh, posthumously just just after the death of Joseph Ratzinger, uh, who served as Pope under the name Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. And it's it's not actually so much a book, it's an anthology, really, a collection of writings. Mm -hmm. But what's significant about them is they were all written during his strange retirement. So during the 10 years that he lived uh, in the, the monastery, uh, some of the writings from that period have already been published, but it will include, it does include the book, some uh, pieces which have never been published uh, before. Yes. And um, it was edited by a theologian and by uh, Monsieur Gernswein, his, his private secretary, who edited this and put it together and put it out. Its title is uh, What is Christianity? Che cosi è il cristianismo? As Matt, I think, said in the beginning, uh, it is uh, in, in Italian, available only in Italian right now. Right. Um, and uh, the uh, just read a little bit from it. it says this volume a translation by Don Montagna this volume which brings together the writings I composed at Maria Ecclesiae Monastery this is Benedict speaking is to be published after my death I have entrusted its editing to Dr. Elio Guerrero I mentioned uh, and uh, gladly entrust him with this my last work and that's the preface by Benedict the right. 16th uh, himself. Um, and uh, just give you a sense, Diane Montagna's post is sort of a list of the chapters. It really is classic Benedict the, the 16th. Uh, one chapter is on clarifying the concept of religions with which the Christian faith seeks to enter into dialogue. So it's again the needle that Benedict the 16th, as Joseph Ratzinger tried to thread poorly in Dominus Jesus, that we're really preserving the Christian teaching while we adopt this new Ecumen, ecumenism. Again, his irreconcilable hermeneutic of continuity, continuity, I would suspect, is in that, that chapter. Right. Two, on the topic of nature, uh, monotheism, and Christian-Islamic relations, so more ecumenism. Chapter three, Christian-Jewish relations, you see the theme. Yes. Uh, four is an interview on the question of why Jesus Christ died uh, in order to restore uh, disrupted order of sin as uh, two texts on the priesthood and the Eucharist as part of it, uh, a developed version of the one published from the depths of our hearts, that intervention, uh, that book that created a big controversy published when Francis was trying to destroy celibacy and a text right. on the bait underway in Germany on uh, intercommunion. Uh, chapter five is on moral problems and on the sexual abuse crisis. And I think chapter five is what's getting the most attention right now. Yes, we'll come back to chapter uh, five in just a second. Just give you the last last bit. Uh, six contains uh, several texts marking anniversaries of the International Theological Commission, which has a pretty uh, 
spotty past in terms of its uh, <laughs> some of its orthodoxy. And then it concludes with an interview on the topic of St. Joseph. So as Matt said, there's information leaking out about the book, some pretty in English. I mean, you could read it in Italian, but in the English speaking world, uh, some of the headlines are catching some statements in chapter five, which are, are, are grabbing uh, in the news. And that is where, as Matt's already mentioned in the intro, uh, basically Pope Benedict, and he said this before, he said he he's learned that seminaries essentially, uh, in many seminaries, gay clubs were established. He essentially confirms, frankly, we already knew, that the seminary formation of priests in the Vatican II church has been taken over and dominated by a Per, uh, lavender mafia by homosexual cliques that are running the seminaries. Again, we know this in English speaking world, Michael Rose's uh, book, Goodbye Good Men. I have to admit it is the only book I, I couldn't finish. It is so uh, just uh, upsetting to read. And he just goes and talks to seminarians, former seminarians all over the United States, documenting the outrageous, flagrant sodomite behavior and clicks in seminaries. It, I was sick to my stomach. I got about two, three fourths of the way through and just couldn't even read anymore. Uh, Benedict the Sixteenth again says he knows this went on, and he uses this to explain some of the root of the uh, sexual abuse crisis. Oh, Matt, are you there? Oops, Matt? sorry, I forgot to unmute uh, or. There we go. Yeah. So the one uh, excerpt that's really getting a lot of uh, circulation online right now, I'll just read it. Uh, it's from that chapter five, and it yeah. says, quote, in several seminaries, homosexual, quote, clubs were formed that acted more or less openly and which clearly transformed the climate of the seminaries. In one seminary in southern Germany, this is Benedict speaking, Candidates for the priesthood and candidates for the lay office of pastoral referral lived together. Now, I don't know what a, a lay office of pastoral <laughs> referral is, but anyway, it goes on to say during communal meals, seminarians were together with married pastoral representatives, some accompanied by their wives and children, and in some cases by their girlfriends. I don't know if the girlfriends is in reference to the, the yeah. lay, um, or the pair or, or the seminary who, who knows who knows <laughs> but it goes on one bishop in the united states who had previously been a rector and this is very shocking yeah. had allowed pornographic films to be shown to seminarians presumably with the intention of empowering them in this way to resist such behavior contrary to the faith well frankly that makes no sense with all right. the respect to benedict the intention would presumably be to inflame their passions and lead them into a life of sexual sin. Yes. Why else would you expose them to that filth? Um, if not to do that, it's certainly not a good strategy to show young men right. pornography as a means of somehow um, strengthening them against that's right. temptation. That's, <laughs> that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's ridiculous. So, um, Unfortunately, we don't currently have a whole lot more um, English translations of the content. As I said, I don't know if there's an English translation in the works. I would assume right. that there probably is or will be in the near future. Um, but it, you know, once it may, becomes available in English, or maybe our our friend Chris Ferrara, who's fluent in La in um, Italian, Italian yes, might yes. be interested in taking a look at it and reporting on it for us. We'll have to see, but but that is what we know about it thus far, and and what we know already is pretty shocking so yes and then some you know one thing i have seen in headlines that i don't quite understand based on the snippets that i've seen thus far but some people like the telegraph for example in their headline for the their article gay clubs run in seminaries says pope benedict in posthumous attack on francis so i haven't yet right. seen content which is attacking francis but somehow for some reason the Telegraph seems to think that it's somehow of an attack on Francis. Well, and that's interesting. If they would link this statement about seminaries to an attack on Francis, why? Because it must mean Francis is okay with this. I mean, that's that's right. seems to be implied by their right. by their headline. Right. All right. Well, that pretty much brings us to the end of our stories for this week. Thank you, everyone who has joined us live, and everyone who will watch the recording. Thank you for joining us. 
Uh, please remember to like this video if you've enjoyed it and share it with your family and friends on your social media uh, accounts. That really does help us a lot to spread the content far and wide. And ultimately, if you enjoy the free content we make available online on our website and, and such, we do ask for your support in the form of a subscription to our monthly publication, Catholic Family News. If you visit our website, catholicfamilynews.com, and click on the new subscription tab, you'll find instructions on how to subscribe. It's only, for those in the United States, it's only $42 a year for 12 issues of the print paper, uh, as well as access to the e-edition uh, in Canada and elsewhere. It's a little bit more expensive. But wherever you are in the world, if you just want access to the e-edition, it's $32 for a year. And it also gives you access to, you know, like 18 months or more of back issues of the paper. So it's it's mm -hmm. quite a deal, quite a deal. And with that, I think we will conclude with a prayer uh, invoking Our Lady in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Eternal Father, offer you the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the instruments of his holy passion. Thou may put division in the camp of thy enemies, for as thy beloved Son has said, a kingdom divided against itself shall fall. St. Polycarp, pray for us. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for your uh, attention and for supporting us again. And uh, we look forward to visiting with you again uh, next week um, when we will tell you, we will give a uh, view of what we've seen over the last week. So thank you. God bless you. God bless.